I didn't set out to be a dope dealer. I'd just imported enough Colombian marijuana to get every inhabitant of the British Isles stoned. <laughs> That's a Welsh part like you doing selling hash anyway. You should have stopped at painting road signs. What was the purpose of a visit? Studying beneficial herbs. <laughs> I said, can you send the Nordal? What the fuck's Nordal? Wise up, you have to use codes. Nordal is hashish. <laughs> Hey you guys are here today with Bernard Rose to talk about Mr Nice. Um, to start with Bernard, we really wanted to talk about your decision to helm the story of this kind of cult figure. I wonder how you first stumbled across Mr Nice and how you decided to take on the project. Well I was originally um, sent the book by the BBC who were developing it um, and I read it and was I, I didn't know anything about how I'd never heard the story before but I was I was bowled over by the book. I thought it was really a fabulous piece of work. Um, it was funny, it was kind of touching, it was kind of insane and uh, had all the elements, really great elements of a great, great story and, and, and that seemed to encapsulate the, the whole history of drugs and the whole history of drug addiction in one kind of very simple narrative. I mean you, you seem to tell his story in a very non-judgmental way. I didn't make any judgments about about Howe's history and about his activities, but it did feel like a very affectionate film. Who was Howard Marks for you? Well, you know, obviously I, I met Howard and spent some time with him when I was writing the screenplay. So, you know, I had the advantage of actually being able to speak to the real guy, and he is very charming and very nice. And yes, you know, you can be judgmental about all, all these kinds of things, but I think that, that you can't make a film that's judgmental of its leading character. I think when you make a film, you have to you have to you have to kind of love the lead. And if you don't, and I'm talking about the actor as well as uh, as as the person it's based on. And if you don't, you can't make a film against somebody. It just doesn't work. The film doesn't work like that. Whoever is the lead character, however however bad their behaviour may be at certain times, you kind of tend to go with them. It's one of the bizarre effects of film, actually. You talked about having to have this affection for your lead and for the, the subject. Obviously, both David and Howard are quite good friends and you had Howard present on set. Did you have any apprehension in kind of having having them there together and that affecting the performance in any way? No, not at all. I mean, it, it was just something that, you know, was something else to draw on, it was just a different kind of energy there. You know, I think this, you know, Plus, I, I don't tend, I don't direct in this sort of control freak way of you stand there and do this. I mean, I just like to have it happen. So, anything that was like that was going on was just more some different kind of energy to draw on, and it's something beneficial. Um, I don't like uh, I don't run run my sets like a kind of um, you know some sort of form of kind of Busby Berkeley dance number with everybody's tap dancing in place or something. And you had another larger-than-life character to manage in the form of Jim McCann. David Thewlis's performance was mm. kind of huge and exuberant and extraordinary. How did you settle upon David to play the part? Well, David was the person I always wanted. I, I, I mean, I, I, I always remembered him from his uh, indelible performance in Naked, the Mike Lee film. Well, he was absolutely stunning. And I also, I think what I loved is particularly about his performance in that film was the way that he kind of pushed Lee away from his normal kind of um, subject matter. It felt like he almost pushed him out of his comfort zone by the intensity of his performance. Um, and it was, I, I'd never forgotten it. And obviously I've seen David do a lot of other things since then, he, he, he works a lot. Uh, but I hadn't seen him give one of those real firebrand, off the leash, crazy performances since then. And, and I, that's what I wanted him, and you know, and he was definitely up for going back there into that zone again and so and so off we went you know no he certainly achieved it i mean it was just a, a huge incredible performance and just mm. felt i understand that you you like to sort of use a first take where possible and it did have that sense of sort of spontaneity and and vibrancy to it was was david kind of able to to maintain that performance throughout was were you able to to capture it in a single take or always yeah i mean I, the way i like to work is i just bring them in and and just say go 
and and and, and, and off it happens, and we don't know where it's going to go. And I and I shoot myself usually handheld, and I just follow them. Um, and uh, you know, and it's an exciting way of working because you don't know what's going to happen, you don't know where things are going to go. Um, and um, you know, he, David really knew how to how to do that. So as did Reese. They they that's why they're so great together because they could just really kind of up, up the ante with each other every time you turn the camera on, and, mm. and it was a joy to deal with them. I mean, as well as those performances, the the whole aesthetic of the film adds to that real tangible sense of, of place and time. How how did you achieve that kind of archive footage look but keep things contemporary? How did you settle on that look? Well, the, the look of the film changes depending on what era it's set because it, I never wanted to actually put a date on anything because the film is set over many years. So in a sense, the dates are somewhat fluid and, f and fungible and flow into one another rather than saying, now it's 1969, now it's 1973, now it's 1976. So you still had to be aware of the change of time. So I did it with the texture of the film, the way it starts in four by three black and white, and then becomes, you know, one eight five black and white, and then becomes color. But it becomes a very sixties kind of faded color with kind of rear projection and kind of that look. And then it becomes very seventies and kind of a bit bluer and more handheld. And then in the eighties it becomes more colorful. So it was a lot of it was quite subtle, but. I think that people were so used to now looking at films from different eras that we intrinsically know the semiotics of how to date a film very precisely within the second half of the 20th century because we're so used to it and the way that the textures of the film changed. So it seemed to me a very easy shorthand to show the passing of time. And that leads us on to our closing question. Speaking of uh, time, we understand that you worked on adapting the screenplay of Clive Barker's The Thief of Time. I wonder if Thief you can tell... Always. Thief of Always. excuse me. I wonder if you can tell us what stage the project's at now. Uh, well, you know, I worked on that a long time ago in right. the 90s and have not been involved since then, oh, so I have no um, involvement or contact with that project anymore. Okay. So um, we have the anniversary of Candyman coming up, also the 20-year yeah. anniversary in 2012. Any intention to release a, a special edition or do a Back to the Future style re-release at all? Well, you know, again, it's, that would be something utterly out of my control since I, it was a work made for hire that I don't own. But um, it, yes, it's, it's nice that people remember the movie, you know, because it was, it was a lot of fun to do, a lot of uh, good bee action going on. None of that was CGI. We did it all with real bees and we put them in Tony Todd's mouth and stuff. Oh, my it was all done completely for real. Well, thank you very much indeed for sitting down with us and we wish you the very best of luck with Mr Nice when it opens. Thank you. Thank you.